We're studying systematic theology, but we're studying one of the most mind-bending subjects in systematic theology. God's sovereign rule over everything. Now, I want, I want, I'm going to ask you some questions. Do you have a Bible question about this? About God's sovereignty? The last class I did was on sovereignty, and I did it up there at New Hope Missionary Baptist Church. What have you got? Have you, Marilyn, do you have any questions about the sovereignty of God? How about you, Sharon? Well, I just have one. Um, because today I had to go to the pharmacy over um, Chester for that kinds of permit. Anyway, I had to pa- park way past the Planned Parenthood and walk by. Then people were demonstrating there. And, you know, I was talking about God being sovereign over people's birth, yet. You know, some don't even. There make are it. children being killed every day. Yeah, that, there are real beings that, being killed every day. And yeah, they're not making it. What about them? I mean, what about why? Because he's also respecting the sovereignty of the parents. I mean, is I mean that's a tough one. Yes, if this is the one of the most difficult, Brother Roger, how about it? Well, it's more a question of about God's patience because. He's sharing sovereignty with um, Satan, who's, who's got free reign for right now, and, and that bothers me. It bothers me too, brother. That is, you are on my page. You're on my page. Let's go to Job, the first chapter. We ought to read the book of Job at least once a year. It bothers you, and it bothers me, that Satan is in control of this world today. He's the God of this, what? Age. I don't like that. I don't either. Uh, I, I, he messes the, 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 oh, He <laughs> makes messes, doesn't he? And, and, and what it, 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 I mean, all this heartache and all this, this insanity and craziness. And, you know, like Chicago, I, Every weekend, there's 11, 12, 13 people shot for no reason. Well, Bakersfield. Well, yeah, well, we. Bakersfield. One, one or two a day, yeah. Yeah, one or two a day are killed in Bakersfield. Or stabbed. Or stabbed something. or shot or robbed or something by the minute. And it's just, it, for what? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, those families and, or like that policeman, the last one. This, this is. So they were 38 years old, you know, or 37 years old. And, Good things happen to bad people. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, doesn't it? This is really a difficult area. It's real difficult. It's real difficult for me. Because I've been to a lot of uh, of purgatory in my life. A lot of bad things. I have got acquainted with a lot of bad people. I've had several contracts out on my life, and if you have never had a contract out on your life, it's very, very exciting. You ought to try it. You'll get PTSD, (laughs) for sure. Now, Brother Roger, you went into danger. For how long were you in Vietnam? One year. year. Flying how often? Um, As often as I got called to. I only flew when there was a battle. Yeah, you flew when there were battles. And you flew a, a killing machine, pretty much. It was loaded, so loaded, that you could hardly take off. And when you got back, it was empty. Because you had exploded all these things in, in these people's lives. You were killing people, and they were trying to kill you. And people were dying all around you. My friend, Ed... In Phillips, Wisconsin, he went into a battle with 5,000 Marines. 5,000 Marines went into that battle against 40,000 Viet Cong. 
he was in there. I don't know how long the battle lasted, but they finally got him out of there fighting all the way. He was still fighting when they drug him on. He was shot in the head and shot in the leg. He was taken down his friend's last words for their mothers or fathers or wives or children and trying to remember all that and fighting all the time he's fighting. And it was rough. Twenty-something people got out of it alive, out of 5,000. He was one of the 20. He cannot talk about it without tears coming to his eyes and telling you the ones that he was taking their last words. That's real hard. When you go into that, Roger, somebody shot you with an arrow, didn't they? They hit your airplane or your helicopter. Right at you, wasn't it? Now, they meant to kill you, didn't they? You're going out there and people are meaning to kill you. Now, that was a long time ago. How many years ago was that? Over 50 years ago. You can remember a lot of it too well, can't you? And hear the screams and the guns and all of that. You hear it. All the things that I've been through, the gunfights and the things. You know, I don't want to be, do this. This is not something I want to do. It just seems like I get in these situations. And I don't want to be in those situations. You know, you shake all over. You shake. In the middle of the night, you jump up, startle center, your heart's flip-flopping and everything else, ready to fight to stay alive. That's rough. We go through it, don't we? We go through it. Job was a good man, wasn't he? He was a good guy. A good guy. He didn't ask for any of this stuff. And yet... God allowed the God of this age to work him over. Now, why did God allow that to happen to Job? Why did he do that, Brother Roger? I asked myself that. I mean, why? Why should he be singled out? Mm-hmm. And, why, why do we survive when others don't? In the army, they call that survivor syndrome. They feel guilty because they survived. Well, Job was written for us. Job, God allowed this to happen to Job for you, Marilyn. Marilyn, you had a rough time for over 60 years of your life. You were imprisoned by your own family. Yeah. Used up. Tortured. Deprived of life. And yet, that happened. Mm -hmm. Those that were guilty went on to their graves and to their rewards. And then others in your family are just like those and they try to take advantage of you, try to kill you, try to do all kinds of things. And so it leaves you with this startle syndrome and this terrible thing. We all have these terrible things happen to us. And yet we aren't really bad, are we? Are we? What did you do to deserve that, Marilyn? What did you do? Marilyn one time saw people treating me really bad, and she was wondering how, why I was such a bad person. <laughs> What's that? She didn't realize that they were the bad people. She didn't know me then. You know well, I we... Had, we You had her, your little Bible, and you'd pray your little Bible and pray and ask God to answer your prayers. Laid in there in the bed one, one night as her, her life was passing before her, and she said, Lord, please send me someone in my life. I want to learn about the Bible. I think you need to go turn the air conditioner down a notch, Marilyn. Please. I said, I'm just about at the end of my rope. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah, just about at the end of my rope. Lord, please send somebody yes. in my life. Well, that happened. Marilyn, can you go turn the air conditioner down just a notch, please? Okay. It's getting very hot up here under these all these lights. Okay. Job went through the ringer for us. What ringer I have gone to, I went to for other people, I guess. Many people come to me, and they want me to counsel them, and they said, well, I know you've been through it. 
I go ask these other people. They don't know what this is all about. They have no idea what betrayal and, and these terrible things. And they have these ideas, you know, that, oh, everything's going to be rosy and everything. A child of God and preachers living in their little palaces and things. And, and it just, you know, they don't understand the common everyday life. So I know you've been through it. So tell me, how do I face this situation? There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and hated evil. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters, ten children. His substance was also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen. And he goes and tells you how rich he was. In verse number three. In verse number four, it says, And his sons went and feasted in their homes, every one on his birthday or feast festival day, and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone, Job would send, and sancti sanct sanct send to sanctify them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to their number. Of them all, and Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed, or God in their hearts. Thus Job constantly protected his children in reference to God. He loved God, and he wanted his children to love God. This man loved God, and he wanted his children to love God. Now, isn't that what you want for your life? Your life? You want your children to love God? Well, I wish all my children were preachers of God's Word, all of them, in some way. I wish they were preachers. I wish that they would send the Word out. I wish that they were in love with God's Word and just uh, couldn't get enough of it. I wish they were missionaries. But you know what? My children aren't. But I have a lot of children that are. They were my children that I raised and I'm in the Lord. Thousands of them all over the world, the Philippines, and China, New York, Mark, in New York, Janine. He listens to these classes each week. These people, the seminary teachers in the Philippines, will listen to my classes, and, and one of them wrote to me, and he says, I am amazed every time I hear one of your messages. And then I go and amaze my students in systematic theology. This is for you. This is for each one of you. And then it says there was a day, there became a day when God, uh, sons of God, now who are these sons of God? Mm -hmm. These are angels. The word sons of God here, B'nai Elohim, in Genesis the 6th chapter also, B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, are the same, they're angels. And they came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Satan. Now this uh, Satan had a name change, didn't he? What was his name before? His name wasn't Satan. His name was Lucifer or Hillel. Hillel is the correct one. It means the shining one. Lucifer comes from the Latin lucere, which means to shine, be bright. Because he was the shining one. He was, uh, he was the archangel and the cherub over the material realm of God. And evidently he was over one-third of the forces of God because the Bible says he took one-third with him. Now, I don't believe one, all of his one-third in the material realm went with him because we still have guardian angels today, don't we? Because we have the God of this world to deal with, we wouldn't need a guardian angel, would we? we have, you, do you, have you experienced a guardian angel, Brother Roger? Sharon? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Absolutely. I have too. Come out of something sometimes so frightening and so death so close to death and then you just say thank you Lord mm -hmm. every time I work on anything whether it's a carpentry electricity especially electricity <laughs> electricity is quite dangerous so can carpentry be sharp things whether it's plumbing or whatever I'm praying all the time I'm working all the time working, I'm praying. And every time something goes right, I say, thank you, Lord. 
And every time something goes wrong, he said, please, Lord, help me figure this one out. This flood today in here. I went out there today and I put my gloves on because I'm old and fragile. And I changed the oil in the Avalon. I always teach people, teach, teach people about that Avalon. I say that's my Rolls Royce. I went down and bought a Rolls Royce. A gold Rolls Royce. I bought a gold Rolls Royce and I took that thing home. And overnight, some rascal went out there and put Avalon and Toyota all over that Rolls Royce. Well, I worked on it, and every time I get and change oil on that thing, I bust my knuckles. So I always wear leather gloves. And the last two or three times I've changed oil on that thing, I bust my knuckles, and this big cut I have in my hand there, I had gloves on. I was prepared. What if I did it without gloves? He would have taken off half of my hide. If he can do that with the leather gloves on, what would it do without them? That's as good as I can do. And I try my best not to do it. But something always gets in the way. And the Lord said unto Satan, From where do you go? And Satan said to the Lord, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Doing what? See what kind of mess he can make. We, he has helpers. I, I have some of my relatives are his helpers. About you, Mary? Yeah. Some of your relatives Satan's helpers? Absolutely. All right, Brother Roger? That's the hard thing, to, the hard pill to swallow when those that you love do this to you. Well, I know. I've seen people's hearts broken by people that they have loved and nurtured and turned against them. Your family. Yeah. People that you love so much and just cut your throat. Terrible. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered, have you got my servant Job on your mind all the time? He's very important to God, wasn't he? Job was so important to God that God wrote a book about him. And there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and upright man, and one that fears God and hates evil. Then Satan answered, Lord, he's got the audacity to talk back to his creator. You know, Atheists all the time striking out and saying, if there's a God up there, strike me dead, and all this kind of baloney, you know. If there's really a God up there, well, I'm going to tell you something, Brother Roger. The words you said were very, you spoke two or three sentences today, and every one of them was loaded, Brother. You said that you were upset that Satan had so much sovereignty over the earth. I am too. You also said that God was very patient. See, I listened to every word you said. That God was very patient with us. And I'm going to tell you something about Satan. God talked mankind into taking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve, her name was Isha at the time. She got a different another name later, Eva, Hava. That was later, which means living one or mother of living, of all living things. She was the mother of all dying things, actually. They sold us out. Now, if you'd have been there, would you have done it? Yep. I know now. <laughs> they knew God, didn't they? Have you ever seen God, Sharon? Not like they do. Marilyn? Have you ever seen God? I've seen God in places. In creation, yes. But we do not see God, do we? I see God in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as it describes the person of Jesus, because Jesus is God. But I've never laid eyes on him in this world. But I know that he is real. I know that he is real. Do you? Do you know that God is real? He's as real as the chair you're sitting on. Actually, more real than that. 
And I'm going to tell you something. Satan's real. Satan is real. He's here. He's right here. He's walking to and fro, seeking whom he may, he may desire. Have you not made a hedge about him? Or are you not protecting Job? About his house and all that he has on every side. Now, can God do that? Yeah, evidently. Can he remove the hedge? Why, Lord, why? Why? That's one of the greatest questions in humanity. Isn't it? Why? Why, Lord? Why are you? Why did you do this? Your blessed work of his hands and his his substance is constantly multiplied. His riches are multiplied. Have you ever seen the rich people that riches multiply? That hate God? That use people? That abuse them? How much does the Bible talk about workman's comp? Plenty. Restitution. It talked about using the poor and abusing them and not paying them enough, not taking care of them. Matter of fact, the Old Testament, there is a lot of tax on riches. Did you know that? There was so much tax on riches in the Old Testament that it was real hard for a rich man to get to become rich if he followed the law. Because it was what we call redistribution of wealth. And we don't like that in the world today. But it was. That's what they did. To keep them from becoming rich. Because they knew when the rich get powerful, they use people. They use people. In America today, I think a little, uh, a little, uh, what we call uh, entrepreneurship, uh, capitalism is good. But, like Teddy Roosevelt said, you can't trust it. You've got to watch it with both eyes. Because they'll use you up. They'll destroy everything. Because behind all of that is what? Greed. Greed. A little socialism is all right, the Bible says. The communist, Karl Marx, he, he uh, based his communism on the Bible. And on early Christianity and on the children of Israel. It's what he based it on. But it's wrong too, isn't it? It's wrong also. Why your Amish and your Mennonites, they live in communal areas, but they do own a certain amount of property, but it's passed on to their families, and they take care of themselves. They live and they take care of each other. That's the Baptist way, people. Those people are Baptists. That's the way Baptists existed for 2,000 years. In America, things change a lot. They haven't, but America changed. They're trying to force them to get Social Security numbers and all that kind of stuff and, and to be part of society, and they just says, you can have it. Separation of church and state, and that's the way they want to live. That's the way they want to live. Too much of anything is a little bit out of balance in there sometimes. But they try to live like the book of Acts tells you. Pour it forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. <clears throat> scary, isn't it? Marilyn, is that scary? Sometimes when you even make an estate... A trust. It's very you gotta be very careful what you do with what you have. The the government on us poor people. If you have anything when you get older, they're gonna get it from you from the medical. <laughs> they'll use you up. They'll you they'll get every dime you get before you hit the grave if they possibly can. It goes right back into the big pot. That's the plan. We see that. And we see all of this. He's, everything that you have is in your power. And only upon him do not put your hand. And old Satan left the presence of the Lord. Now he's in the presence of the Lord. This happened one time. This is real. This isn't a, a story. 
They say the book of Job was one of the most beautiful poetic books in the history of the world. Did you know that? There's more than poet, it's more than poetry in here. This is truth. And there was a day when the sons of God, when, when his sons and daughters were drinking, guess what happened? They all got killed. He started losing all of his property. And all this, his daughters, sons, all got killed. His servants got killed. All that he had was taken by others and stolen. You know, sometimes in families, sometimes you can spend your whole life throw it away on those that you love. So it's all gone until you're in the poorhouse. Until you're in the poorhouse. And they'll go on, they're not going to care about you. You can do it. That happens all over, doesn't it? It happens. The Lord tests us in so many ways, doesn't he? It tells us about how all this happened, how people were killed, how his family were killed, and everyone, Chaldeans and Sabians. And then verse 18, he said, While that one was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are all dead, and only I escaped to tell you. Job arose and tore his, his coat and shaved his head in mourning and fell down on the ground and got mad at God. What's it say? He's worshipped the Lord. God won. But through Job, losing everything. The only thing he left for Job was a contentious, hateful, ungodly wife. Satan knew who to kill and who not to kill. He left that woman to be a thorn in his flesh. He said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. And the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken, and blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job that sin not and charge, nor charge God foolishly. Now, I just wanted to go introduce that to you. Now, let's go to page 180. Okay. Page 180. <clears throat> page 180. Down in the middle of the page. Now, everything I'm going to read here to you is going to seem like we're just got to get all this stuff. Because you're going to see all the positive things about God's sovereign control. But we know the negative side too, don't we? That God respects the volition of everything, including Satan. And all of the angels that followed him and all of the spirits are demons as we know them now that followed him. And you. God respects your sovereignty, doesn't he? Sharon, you saved? Yes. Absolutely. Marilyn, you saved? Marilyn, are you saved? Yes, I am. Okay, Brother Roger, you born again? All right. Now, are you a Lord's? The Lord belongs. You belong to the Lord? You are. But does he make you do everything? Do you follow his every beaten path? Do you? Do you? Sometimes you follow the temptation, don't you? Yeah. Sometimes you follow your tempers and your wants and your needs and your not so much needs. And you know when you're going the wrong way. You know that. And sometimes you just tread there anyway, don't you? Well, let's read some of these things. Over all the individuals, over a man's birth and lot in life, Sharon, you talked about going and getting your prescription and going by the Planned Parenthood where they kill babies. We have babies murdered all over America and all over the world. We have grown-ups murdered. We have preachers killed. 
We have preachers killed, children tortured and killed all over in the world, usually by Islam. Hardly any other religion. Catholicism used to kill a lot of people. But they're not in power much in many places in the world today. But Islam is wide open. They're still murdering and killing. Enslaving. We do not in America believe in slavery, slavery, neither do they in England or France or Germany or any of these places, but in Islam, slavery exists and it is a quite an economic advantage, isn't it? When you can buy somebody, Marilyn, have you ever been used as a slave and not paid? <laughs> have you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's real cheap. You know what? I could take care of this 40 acres right here. If I, if I had about five or six slaves that I only had to feed just a minimal amount of food mm -hmm. and, and, and house them in whatever I wanted to put them in, I could take care of this place and I could make money. But right now, it's me. Me, myself, and I, and I am the head slave on this plantation. I can assure you. That's it. It's not very lucrative. A God has, has sovereignty over our births and our deaths. How many children did God allow to be killed today? This is his permissive will. Do you think it's his direct will that they were killed? I will say this, and I think Brother Madden, I... I that man had a great effect on my life, I'm telling you. I, I'm really glad that he was part of my life. Brother Darius Sherwood Madden, a mean man sometimes, people say, always oh, mean. I was in his classes. I went all over the world with him. I went over uh, Italy when we were, uh, flew into Rome, and he said, right down there is where I had to kill a little boxy gumbo on Anzio Beach. He was un entrenched in Anzil Beach. He, he was ushered out of the army. He was a sergeant major. He was ushered after the, out of the army after Anzio. He was shot, destroyed. His body was physically incapable of being a soldier any longer. He was discharged. <coughs> he was a big man, six foot six, six foot eight, somewhere around there. 300, 400 pounds. Big man. He came out of Anzio Beach, 140-something pounds, starved to death. Terrible condition. Terrible condition. He said, it was all over the Middle East. He started out in Africa with uh, uh, Audie Murphy. He was right with him all along through all of that. Out into Africa. Well, they went after those German tanks over there. What was that uh, guy's name over there in Africa that they were? Rommel? Rommel. Rommel. After Rommel. Went into Italy. Over there in Anzio for weeks and weeks and weeks. What, six, nine months or something like that? They were entrenched down on that, in that mud. People dying. Vaporized right before their eyes sometimes with shells. Come back. We went over to the Middle East. I tell you what, I never saw a man use such harsh words about these people. He said these heathens don't deserve one breath of God's air. Not one breath of God's air. Heathens. Absolute heathens. Religious heathens, he called them. He said, I thank God every time one of them Muslim babies dies. I thank God every time one of them dies, every time one of them is aborted or, or doesn't born into this world because they, they got to go be with God. God wins. God wins. When you, those babies died, God wins. Maybe they were raised by drug addict mothers and fathers, raised to be just like them, abused all their lives. Sometimes God takes them out of this world because... It would be too rough. They were too good for the world. Too good for the world. Over a man's birth and lot in life, 
Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, and I have provided me a king among his sons in 1 Samuel 6 and 1. And who knows whether you are not come to the kingdom for such a time as this in Esther 4.14, as her uncle told her. You've been born for this reason, to save your people. Your eyes did not see my unformed substance in your book they are all written even the days of the, even the days were ordained for me when as yet there was none of them before I ever existed God knew me before I ever was born Psalm 139 16 I will gird you though you have not known me Isaiah 45 and verse 5 Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you, sanctified you. I have appointed you, Jeremiah 1 and 5. And God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, Galatians 1, 15, 16. That's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, I was aborted. I was aborted. He was a child of Satan. He was going, killing Christians, destroying churches, and God stopped him on the way to Damascus. I've been there. I've been in that church house where he was baptized. In Damascus, Syria, you know, that's a pretty dangerous place to be. I can tell you, it's a pretty dangerous place to be then. When I went down every day, we'd take off and walk. It's too dangerous to drive. We walked and got kind of outside the city and got on a bus and got out of there. I'm telling you, those people drive like worse than Tijuana. Tijuana's a tame place compared to that. You go out there through Arvin sometimes, you think you're in little Tijuana. <laughs> people run stop signs, whatever, they run out in front of you, walk out in front of you, whatever, it don't matter. And that's the way it is in Damascus, Syria. When you come to the corner, you honk your horn, and you got the right away when you honk that horn. And then you just plow through. You see people running over, jumping over the sidewalks and everything else, jumping up, trying to get away from the traffic, these maniacs. No traffic rules, just free-for-alls. Boy. Well, God even gets glory from all these aborted babies because they're going to be with him. I believe all of them are covered by the blood of Christ. Islam, Catholics, all. Buddhists. Just think about that for a minute. Brother Madden, when I was over there in that heathen country, in Damascus, Syria, the first time he told me that, he said, I thank God for every child died before it come to cage accountability. Think about that for a while. I'm, I'm thankful for every one of them gets run over by a car or kicked in the head by a camel or something. God overruled that situation, didn't he? Did he or not? If they were left to live and go on, they might be murdering somebody today, saying, Allah Akbar, God is greater. Allah is greater. Allah and God are not the same people, by the way. Allah was imaginary God of Islam, Muhammad. Elohim. Jehovah Elohim is the great God that we serve you, that we serve today and that is over all the sovereignty of mankind. But we live within his permissive will sometimes in his uh, what we call uh, not his direct will but in his permissive will. God's eternal purpose and unpreventable progress. Think about that. God's eternal purpose and unpreventable progress. God will continue to proceed exactly things will proceed as he wants them to proceed regardless of how many atheists are god hating religionists in the world today he it will get where he wants it to go it's going to happen what he wants to happen is going to happen second over the successes and failures of men neither from the east nor of the west nor yet from the south comes lifting up but God is the judge he puts down one and lifts up another Psalm 75 6 and 7 yet all within his unpreventable progress 
and his permissive will, yet sovereignty. That's hard to understand, isn't it? He has put down princes from their thrones and has exalted them from low degree. Luke 1 and 52. The king's heart is in the hand of Jehovah as the water courses. He turns it wherever he wishes it to go. Why, up there in Chattavish Creek right now, I'm telling you, that creek's going where it wants to go. One place it cut out, one down a completely different ravine, and goes out a quarter of a mile down from where it normally goes. And evidently it went there before because they had a culvert underneath the road there, and here it fills up that ditch, and it's going out there. That lake that Jim Boyce destroyed, put all that drilling mud down in it and concrete and everything on top of it to stop the spring up, is pushing out a little bit. That lake used to be 78 degrees year-round, lots of hot water flowing out of the bottom of it, and all the streams going into it. I think the lake may have some water in it this year. I know that the, the, the spring in the bottom of it is, is bubbling up a little bit, yet it's been destroyed. It will never be like it was. It can't be. Too much damage, too much destruction like Satan. The earth will never be the same in man's hands. But in the new heaven and new earth, even the millennial reign when God reforms it for a thousand years, it's going to get better at the end of that because there won't be one fingerprint of humanity on the earth. It'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Think about that one now. Proverbs 21, verse 1, Jehovah kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and brings up. Jehovah makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and he lifts up the needy from the dunghill to make them sit with princes and inherit the throne of glory, 1 Samuel 2, 6 and 8. How many of you like to watch old cowboy movies? Are they fun? Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Randolph Scott. Randolph Scott looked exactly like my grandfather, my Cherokee grandfather. He even talked like him. I used to watch that after my grandpa was dead, and I was thinking, there's my grandpa up on that screen. I'd hear his voice. He didn't speak very often. Randolph Scott talked a whole lot more than he did. But his voice sounded and he looked a lot like him. You see, in your parents you ought to see God. In your parents you ought to see God. I know you did, Roger. In your parents you ought to see God. You ought to see God's love. You ought to see God's protection. You ought to see the love of God. Children ought to love their parents as if they were God. As if they're God's representative on earth. You are taught from the word of God to teach your children to fear God and yet not fear you but to respect you but to fear right and wrong. You're taught that. If your parents did not give you that, they short changed you. They short changed you. They got to show you sacrifice and love. That they love you more than they love themselves. That they'll sacrifice their lives for your life. God did, didn't he? He gave his only begotten son to whosoever believes in him not, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jehovah gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Exodus 12 and verse 36. Third, over the seemingly accidental and insignificant things in life, if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint you a place wherever he shall flee. Exodus 21, verse 13. For affliction comes not from the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground. Job 5 and 6. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of Jehovah. Proverbs 16, verse 33. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered in Matthew 10 and 30. And God didn't have to anymore after that chemotherapy and radiation. He hadn't had to have to count so many of mine. They went away and never came back real good. I'm an old Indian, you know. Indian's supposed to have hair. Still got some, a little bit. All turned gray last year. Used to be black as a crow's wing. 
we look back over our lifetimes. How many lifetimes has God given you? How many times has your life changed? How many different episodes have you been on? While we were in church up there the other day, and Marilyn told the pastor up there, she said, this is like a stage, and we're the actors. And God's watching us. Fourthly, over the needs of God's people in peace, I will I both lay me down and sleep for you, Jehovah, alone make me dwell in safety, Psalm 4 and 8. We've had some close encounters, haven't we? Roger, you have close encounters? Yeah. But you're here. We can have close encounters and sometimes we're touched by them. We have the scars of them on our hearts and our minds and on our persons. You will bless the righteous, O Jehovah. You will compass him with favor as with a shield. Psalm 5 and verse 12. I think this is more wishful thinking than all, than everything. Sometimes some of this is a little taken a little out of context, isn't it? Your right hand upholds me, Psalm 63 and verse 8. And he that keeps ye will not slumber. The one that keeps us will not sleep. God's never asleep, is he? Psalm 121 verse 3. To them that love God, all things work together for the good, to the called. Romans 8 and 28, My God shall supply every need of yours. Philippians 4 19, Neither has I seen nor God beside thee who worketh for him that waits for him. Psalm 64 and verse 4. We'll quit right there for today. Right there, and I want you to think about this. What did you learn in this lesson, Sharon? That God is sovereign because He knows the big picture. Yeah, He and sees the big picture. He sees just a little bit more than God. Yeah, we see very close, don't we? We see up close. 200 years from now, if the world has not come to the end, will the world remember you? Will it remember you? Will you even have one descendant that will remember you? Marilyn, do you know who your great, 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 great grandfather was? No. No? Marilyn, how about Jeremy? I've got a list. Yeah, I do. You've got a list <laughs> yeah. that they actually live. Yes, the, the charts, names, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I, I do. I'm, I'm blessed that way because I know that's rare. Yeah, that's very rare. Sometimes you can. The Chickasaw side of my family were very, very famous, and I can trace them back to the 1400s when they hooked on that old Spaniard down there when he went into Alabama and Mississippi and chased him off across the state I plains. Know where We know where our ancestors came from. Mine, most of them were here. I got that. I'm 132nd white from that Scottish boy, Smith Paul. Go back there to Dundee and Scotland and over in that area where my DNA shows that it went. Rand Paul, Ron Paul, they were from that side of my family, the Paul side of my family. They were John Paul Jones. I know that they lived. John Paul Jones' friend, bosom mate, loved John Paul Jones, and he thought it was a terrible crime the way the United States government treated him. John Paul died. John Paul Jones died in Paris, France, in absolute abject poverty, in a apartment room. His friend went in there, looked at him. He said, if America actually survives, one day this man will be one of the greatest heroes in American history. He won the war with England, you know. I mean, he did it. He took the war to them. He whooped the socks off them. They told him they was going to give him a navy. He said, give me ships. They sent him off over there and never paid him a dime. His wages were what he stole from the English and the British. And he stopped them. And you know the old story is that, that, 
that he was having this naval battle and his ship was sinking. Two-thirds of his men were, were already dead. And the admiral on the other side says, uh, Sir, wilt thou surrender? He said, I haven't yet begun to fight, whether that's truth or not. But he whipped that guy. He whipped him. Napoleon Bonaparte said, if Sam, if uh, John Paul Jones had been my admiral, I could have whooped the world. And no, he could not. He wasn't. And he couldn't whoop the world. Even though he was a great man, yet he died in abject poverty. In 1905, Theodore Roosevelt went over there and retrieved his body because his friend had had a coffin made for him and lined it with lead and filled it with brandy to preserve his body and put it in a graveyard that was marked. And then they built a house on top of the graveyard. They dug underneath that house and retrieved the body of John Paul Jones and they sent the great white fleet over there to pick him up in 1905 and came back to Annapolis, Maryland and Theodore Roosevelt walked out and marched in front of the coffin of John Paul Jones because he was one of the greatest heroes of the American people. And yes, he was remembered. He's remembered today. But how many of his soldiers that fought with him are gone into oblivion of no one's memories? And yet every person lived and died. One of the most joyous things about living on this farm for the last 20 years are the little animals that God gave me to take care of. I loved them. I remember them. I even have dreams about them. I love animals. And they seem to love me. And I take care of them better than anybody else takes care of them. My son once told his friends, he said, dad, my dad can take care of animals better than anybody's dad in the world. My dad can make an animal live longer than anybody. He said he's had some real old chickens and real old dogs and real old cats, real old horses. They weren't supposed to live that long, but he takes care of them, he watches them, and cares for them and nurtures them. And that boy took care of his wife to her last breath. He did. Learn how to nurture and care for one another. I have wonderful memories of Bobby and Peanut and Jojo and Stills and I, Ducky and Lucky and Wilbur and even Daisy. I have wonderful members of all those, those little animals out there. Cutie the goat, Charlie the, the llama, Louie the goat. They stole my heart and star. They used to come and ring the doorbell and want a treat, the pony. Ducky that guarded me and walked me for eight years every step of the way on this farm. And Bobby who played tricks on me constantly. I'd go out there every morning to feed everybody and Bobby would come over there. She was a bobtail cat of Kitty's little daughter. And I'd open the door to the feed house and zip she goes in there and goes and hides. In the summertime, it's hot in there. And I have to go in there three or four times to go try to coax her out of there and get her out of there. And it seems like she's ha, ha, ha. And as Peanut would walk down there, Bobby the trickster would walk behind and grab a hold of her tail and just drag. And Peanut would just put up with it. And Stills would sleep on Peanut's back. And Peanut would go out there every day in the wintertime and lay down and in the summertime and lay down out there and Cutie the goat would lay down by her and Peanut would lay her head on the goat and Ducky would come out between her legs and sit there and guard them all. And if you go to my daughter's big sister, you see the pictures that I took of them and everything. Yeah, these little animals have souls. They're individuals. Every, just think about the magnificent, the magnitude of all of these things that happen in the history of mankind. We don't know one name of the pets of Adam, do we? Do we? God created his animals 
four companions, didn't he? And he named every one of them, it says. And we don't have their names. But yet they lived. You know that you came from Adam, don't you? But how many through the maze of humanity? You might check yourself out and have for three or four or five hundred years. How many hundred years do you have, Sherry? Uh, on my mother's side, go back to 1550. 1550. Beyond that. See, there's a blank wall back there. But there's a whole bunch of those people, and they had pets. And they cared for others. They loved others. How many soldiers have died on the battlefield? How many soldiers have shed their blood in the history of mankind? For some sovereign? For some good deed? Or some evil deed? How many? And yet God remembers and counts all of them, doesn't he? The sovereignty of God. God's unpreventable progress and eternal purpose. Father, I send this message out for you that make people think. And comfort people so many times in the loss of their loved one children. We know that you pull strings. We know that you raise kings and kings fall. But we also know that evil men wake, they rise up to great power, and then they fall. Nothing is eternal in this world except for you. Father, protect us from all evil. Help us to glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.